Good afternoon. It is August 12th of 2024. We're certainly glad that everyone could join us. It's an important update. It's the update following that Black Monday that we all experienced in the market last week. And while it is important, I also don't want to belabor too much time on that sell-off because I think one of the big lessons that last week provided to us as investors, not as day traders, not as hour-to-hour -hour traders or algorithmic operators, is that time in the market, really at the end of the day, is the number one barometer of long-term returns. There are many investors last week that got scared and sold. And in some cases, probably realized five, six, 10, 12% losses or greater, only to see that the market completely bounced back by Thursday at the close. And when we look back at investment experiences, and when we look back at where a lot of investors fall short over a long period of time, it is periods like Monday or really the last two weeks, which have been a little bit nerve wracking in the market, lots of volatility that gets scared. They sell, they panic sell, and then they'll say, well, I'll get in when things look less scary. But it often is when things are scary that we either want to stay put or we want to put more money to work. And that is the challenge of investing because it goes against our very human DNA. As humans, we are designed genetically to try and survive, not to thrive, to try and survive. And when we see scary conditions, we seek shelter. But in investing, we have to flip that script. And we have to say, when things look scary, we want to be opportunistic. And when everyone looks greedy, that's perhaps when we do want to pull back from risk a little bit. So we're going to go through this week what Monday meant, some of the big lessons take away from it, and what does the market look like after the sell-off, and how should we be opportunistically looking at various sectors or geographies or asset classes as a result of what took place. Now, the title of this week's presentation is called The Day After, right? And why is that? Because we had this huge sell-off across the world. The Nikkei went down something like 13% overnight, right? And 25% over a one to two week time period. It makes for a great news story, but it doesn't really mean anything if you're an investor in individual stocks or US markets. Really at the end of the day, we saw stocks, for example, that opened down 20% on Monday and by 1 p.m. Pacific or 4 p.m. Eastern, we're flat. Did the fundamental backdrop of that company change by 20% during that time period? Of course not, right? A lot of this is driven by panic selling, computer program selling, algorithms, a lot of the impact from the mechanical issues that we saw from the carry trade on wine in Japan, but very little in retrospect to do with the economy. Now, the economy is certainly slowing, and we'll discuss that and what that means for asset allocation but it's important to separate mechanical from fundamental. So this week, we're gonna talk about three concepts, time in the market versus timing in the market. Number two, mechanical versus fundamental selling, right? So last week, was that mechanical? In other words, was it some sort of trade unwind that was taking place that caused steep drops or was it more fundamental? The result of a slowing economy going into a recession, leading to earnings drops. Lastly, uh, is the economy slowing or is it shrinking? That may sound like one and the same, but the, the nuances are very important. The difference between slowing and shrinking could mean the difference of a raging bull market or a nasty bear market. So we'll go through that. And then lastly, what areas may benefit or lose from a lower interest rate environment? So real quick here, the benefits of coaching. I think this is one of the most impactful charts that uh, we can look at as investors or advisors. We look at the impact of missing the very best days in the market, right? So we looked at over the last 10 years, had you invested $100,000 in the S&P 500, what would that money have grown to? So in other words, if you invested every single day, you never touched your money, that 100,000 would have grown to $462,575. 
But if you had just missed the 10 best days across a decade, not 10 best days in a year, but 10 best days in a decade, you're the, the amount of money that you would have grown would have gone from 462000 down to 257000 Had you merely missed the 30 best days, that would have dropped to 151000 And if you missed the 51 best days, right, you would have actually lost money. What's the message here? Is that a lot of the times these best days occur right after big market drops. So when you sell as a measure of protection with the idea that, hey, I'm going to get back in when things feel and look better, this is what you're setting yourself up for. It's not that you're going to have a smoother return path. You're just going to leave money on the table and the stats back this up. This is one of many charts like this, whether we're going back 20, 30, 40, 50 years, the message is the same. It's about time in the market, not timing the market. And it's hard because it's emotional. It's volatile. Things go up and down. You watch your account values swing back and forth, layer on 24 seven media, social media, conspiracy theorists. And you can see how people get frightened, right? And you can empathize with why people are becoming frightened. Because the more you hear of something, the more true it is. But the one overarching truth that we know going back over a hundred years is that time in the market versus time in the market has been the number one wealth accumulator in human history. And we stand by that. And we're not biased toward whether we're talking about our tactical strategies, passive, a passive approach to investing, or you know, just a basic global mutual fund. Time in the market outweighs timing the market. And so I think Monday was a great example of why we want to adhere to that approach. So what happened? We saw a lot of blind selling on, on Friday that leaked into Monday. Not surprised by that. When you get a big risk off event in fr on Friday going into the weekend, uh, you usually do get some sort of gap lower on that Monday. And when we certainly saw the, when we saw the Nikkei and how it traded Sunday night and into Monday morning, not surprised at all. So anytime you have a major market that goes down 13% in one day, you can be assured that that volatility is going to spread. It becomes some, somewhat contagious, right? Because people say something is wrong a major global economy, their stock market went down 13% in one day, I'm going to take some risk off the table. I don't care why or what uh, are the reasons. I'm just going to take some risk off the table. And that begins a domino effect across global markets. As we know, as we said before, Nikkei down 12.4, 13%, whatever number you want to use, it's a, it was a big number. 25.5% since July 11th. This was one of the leading markets uh, throughout the year going into July. This is why we talked about, yes, when people ask us, how come you're not in the Magnificent Seven? How come you're not in Japan? How come you're not in these glorified trades? It's because it was expensive. And a lot of times expensive trades can unwind very fast, right? It's this classic taking the escalator up, but then the elevator down. So investors panicked and sold and assumed the worst, right? Oh, you know, Black Monday, depression, economy is going into a recession. We got the election coming up. All of this is starting to make sense. Wrong, right? It turns out most of that selling was mechanical, a reaction to the carry trade on wine that was taking place in Japan. People using 0% interest rates to lever up trades overseas, especially in the US where you had high interest rates earn that spread difference, take that spread, lever up even more and buy the Magnificent Seven names, which artificially suppress volatility at the index level. Why? Because those seven names make up over 30% of the S&P 500. So on the surface, you had this very low volatility environment that was being suppressed by the carry trade. So when you remove that, what happened? Volatility came roaring right back. In reality, though, 
the underlying companies are doing okay. If not, maybe at the top there, as we talked about before, those ones are uh, definitely appearing a little bit expensive. But the bottom line is here, that panic seller would have locked in 10% plus losses versus those who didn't even care. Those who didn't even care came across relatively unscathed. And I think that's an important point. The golfer on Monday who didn't check his phone made more money last week than the person sitting at their computer biting their fingernails and trying to catch the top or bottom of this market. So we talk about the short-term versus long-term. Part of our jobs as advisors, as portfolio managers is to coach people on the benefits of long-term investing, but at the same time, keep them informed, right? To coach them. It's hard to coach if you don't address the 800-pound gorilla in the room. Hey, the market went down four, five, six percent last night, 13 percent in Japan. You can't just say, I don't know. I didn't pay attention to it. So we do need to pay attention to the short term to help client coach clients through that short term, uh, those short term environmental conditions so we can set them up for success over the long term. So when the markets do experience an earthquake like we did on Monday, the truth is, and it is rare for that sell-off to end overnight, right? So we we have a phrase that we say, it's sell-off start with a bang, right? And what would definitely, um, Friday, Monday of last week and the week prior would definitely be considered a bang. But they tend to end with a whimper where the, the headline indices may challenge or even uh, undercut the initial low, but at a much lower volume where underneath the surface, more and more stocks had already bottomed on that initial bottom. And it's more the large stocks that make new lows, dragging the index lower. But longer term, right? If you're not someone who's trying to pick that exact day, that exact hour, that exact penny where the market bottoms, the bigger story may very well be what happens to forward returns when volatility spikes. When we see the VIX or a measure of volatility take a four or five sigma move or standard deviation move to the upside, those typically are times you want to start putting money to work. Does it mean that you're going to time the bottom to that minute? No, right? And sometimes you may lose money initially. But when you look back, and we're going to show the results of this in the chart. Historically, you make some pretty decent excess returns. Not 100% of the time, but a lot of the time. And then lastly, what does the market environment look like post this sell-off, right? What are some of the key characteristics that are changing, that are related back to the economy, that are related back to inflation and interest rates? And how does that change our thoughts about where money should be putting to work within the market? Not in the market or out of the market, but within the market. So there's been... Two other uh, mechanical sell-offs. I mean, there's been a lot of mechanical sell-offs related to uh, various trades being unwound, computer selling, et cetera. But there's two that come to mind for us. And one is the LTCM crisis back in 1998, which was a large hedge fund uh, that went through a rapid unwind as a result of many trades that had gone offside. And then, of course, 1990 related to the Gulf War. With both of those instances where the economy was fine, companies on the S&P 500 were fine, but the mechanics were not fine, right? Someone was majorly offside on a trade. We got this big whoosh lower on a panic. We bounced, and then we got a revisit of the low. Now, each time, the percentage of stocks at 20-day lows started to fade, right? In other words... Fewer and fewer stocks were revisiting those lows as the overall market was. That's a sign of a bottom. That's a sign that actually you want to put money to work during that initial sell-off and find the leadership companies because it's those other companies that are probably going to probe new lows. Same thing happened in 1990 with the Gulf War. Big move lower, bounce, a secondary low. But look, notice what happens here. The percentage of stocks hitting 20-day lows on the final low in the market was a lot lower than the initial sell-off. In other words, 
underneath the index, underneath the misleading hood of the index, more and more companies were bottoming before the market did. And the same thing actually played out in 2008, where even in a fundamental sell-off, you want to look for those areas of the market that are bottoming ahead of the index. China, um, technology stocks in the U.S., those were the initial groups and commodities were the three big groups that bottomed in November of 08, almost four or five months ahead of the overall market, which bottomed in March of 2009. So if you go back to the charts of Apple or Google or Alibaba, or where, like, Alibaba may not have actually been public back then, but a lot of the Chinese stocks, like the Chinese banks, you would see that they actually bottomed in November. That was when China introduced its massive stimulus, right? So the market started to read what were going to be the next bull markets as the U.S. took care of its banking and housing problem, right? And technology, of course, was the one major sector that would go on to rip for the next decade. Uh, the other big reason, but short term, so shorter term, why we say we might have some more selling, less intense than Monday or Friday, um, the reason why we might have a little bit more selling to go is that the percentage of stocks above the 50-day moving average, quite frankly, has never really reached that extreme level, which you typically need to flush things out. So we didn't get that. We got panic selling for sure, but we didn't have as many stocks as we would like to participate in that over a two, three, or four-day sustained period as we would like to see during a final flush. A few other factors here to suggest that, hey, we might have some more days ahead where you see some red. Is that 20-day lows, is, are they greater than 50%? No, we only hit about 44% on Monday. Or percentage of stocks above the 50-day moving average, right now 47%, right? So we'd like to see that less than 20%. Put call ratios are not panicky yet, right? The only spot where we did really see panic was on the VIX inversion, right? So in other words, people were so panicked for protection that they were buying volatility. Uh, they were buying calls on volatility short term. In other words, I need it today, not in three months, that it caused an inversion. And typically you have things in contango where the longer I have my protection good for, the more I'm going to pay for it. That got inverted. In other words, I don't want to buy life insurance for the next six months. I want to buy it just for the next week. That's unusual. It doesn't make sense usually. But during times of panic, that can make sense. And that's what happened in the overall market. But here's the good news behind that. When volatility is super high, and we talked about this a couple of slides ago, that forward six-month return for the S&P 500 tends to be pretty high. Tends to be in that 10th decile, right? So we look at the VIX by death styles, right? So when the VIX is at its highest point, historically, the S&P 500 six month forward performance averages just around 12% versus if it's at the low end, it's in around four or 5%. The outlier are these big VIX surges when volatility is very high. So that's where the six month performance is most attractive is buying the market, buying risk, during these times of panic. We did get the question, is this 2007, 2008? I don't think so. And I say I don't think so because no one really knows, right? But we really do pay attention uh, to what the market is doing. We don't try to make a guess of what it will do next, right? We try to pay attention to the symptoms. Um, if you go to the doctor, they're not saying, hey, we think you're going to get XYZ type of condition in a year, they measure your symptoms today, and then they take a course of action. And that's what we do with the market. We look at the conditions of the market today and take a course of action. And when we look at 2007, many sectors, breadth and momentum had started to fade. Fewer and fewer stocks were participating in new highs. Versus today, most sectors have very positive breadth. And you even seen in those short-term momentum charts we saw a couple slides ago, where we still are not that flushed. That's underlying, the underlying picture, the underlying backdrop of the market is one of health, is one of stability, even though you get these two or three days where it looks like the world is ending. And so that's what makes us a, a little bit more positive that we're not in the recession camp. 
were not in the 2007, 2008 camp, that were more in the LTCM 1998 or 1990 or even 2012 camp. So then the question comes down to what type of environment are we going to face when the selling stops or when the selling calms down or flushes out or ever however you want to call it. And then I think the big message here is that we're going from a high interest rate environment where inflation was high, where we had significant, uh, not just inflation, but we had significant excess savings uh, at the consumer level to an environment where the economy is clearly slowing, savings rates are down, consumers have spent through their savings, and inflation has come down significantly. In other words, we're going from expensive an expensive money environment to a cheap money environment. And we see that in the charts here, whether it's the 10-year interest rate breaking down through support, or we look at what the two-year yield is doing. Now, the two-year yield is important because the two-year yield really does tend to move in cycles. When it makes a turn, it's making a turn based on where the, whether the Fed is going from a hiking campaign or to a cutting campaign. Right now, it looks like we've made a turn. And every other previous turn that the two-year yield has made has coincided with a cutting campaign. And why is that? Well, the economy is slowing. Manufacturing has slowed into contraction. But the service and manufacturing new orders are slowing down. Not in contraction, but slowing down. Employment growth is slowing down. And the last thing that is important, because the Fed is actually or has been trying to get these first three things to happen on purpose. Why? To bring inflation down. So what is our playbook then if we are confident that we're going into a slowdown, but not a recession? A recession, you want to raise cash. You want to buy government bonds. You want to play defense. On a soft landing or a slowdown where we don't go into contraction, you actually want to consider some offense. You want to consider growth companies that can benefit from low rates or companies that have leverage on their balance sheets that are weighed down by high interest rates that can recapitalize at a lower rate structure, sending up their equity value. These are the types of things we want to look at. So what are these areas that benefit from lower rates and potentially deregulation if we get a certain type of administration that takes office? Digital assets such as Bitcoin or small caps or regional banks, commercial real estate. We actually had a couple of commercial real estate firms uh, over the last week on their earnings calls say that, you know what? Things are getting a little bit better. Things are not getting worse. That rate of change is slowing down to the downside, right? We look at rate of change, that second derivative. When that second derivative starts to improve, a lot of times it's good to buy those stocks. REITs, believe it or not, are actually one of the top performing sectors year to date. Um, M&A, merger and acquisition activity. And then, of course, just your traditional cyclical stocks that tend to do well when we go into that soft landing type of environment. So the bottom line here, ladies and gentlemen, is that volatility blow off tops are historically a time for discipline and not a time to sell. Right. Right now, the selling appears to be more technical or mechanical, not fundamental. That can change. But as of right now, as of the time of this recording, it's what it appears like. And then during these types of environments, we want to focus on what is working in a low rate environment when the noise ends, because that's the one thing I think that uh, most people are starting to align themselves around is that inflation has come down enough. We are going to get a rate cut, it appears, in September, and we should get more rate cuts after that. So what does that environment look like? So that's what we got for you this week. 888-543-3776. Uh, Please feel free to reach out to us. Have a wonderful week. And again, thank you for your business and never hesitate to reach out to us or your advisor. We're here to help. We know things can be scary out there, especially last week. But the old adage of time in the market, not time in the market, is critical, critical to long-term returns. Thank you again. Have a fantastic week.